we need to do better as reptile keepers, especially with, but also regardless of this new legislation that's trying to be passed here in the United States. We need to break out of this dogma to improve the lives of, but also selfishly, right, to improve the interaction with our beautiful little scaly creatures. Stick around to the end of this video and we'll talk about how we can start to do this together. of course is Bartaby, who's a beautiful little bearded dragon. Let's start with some background on me to kind of give you guys an understanding of why it is that I, I take husbandry so seriously and how I'm always looking to improve. So when I was just a wee little lad, my parents finally agreed to let me have a pet lizard. And oh boy, was I excited. Thanks mom and dad. And I know you're like the only two people that watch this. So I love you. No, I'm just kidding. I love Everyone that watches these videos and all the subscribers, so if you're watching right now, right, Barnaby? As I was saying, I was like nine years old and they finally let me have a lizard. It was a little Chinese water dragon. Chinese water dragons get wild caught and, and distributed to all these chain pet stores. And you know, it's really sad because they're an awesome lizard, but they, it's almost like the iguana thing, how like iguanas are like 25 bucks, but then it turns into a giant monstrosity, a beautiful monstrosity. Water dragons, you know, they're semi-aquatic and semi-arboreal. So you need trees plus a water feature and all that kind of stuff. They're definitely not pets that should be readily available for a low price at chain pet stores. But regardless, that's, that's what we got. And I was super excited to have little Jimmy, but... I definitely did everything all wrong. I don't know, he was on reptile carpet. He had like a 20 gallon enclosure. We had a big water bowl in there for him, but it wasn't a good time. It wasn't a good time in the end really for me, but more importantly, it was not a good time for young Jimmy. Luckily, Jimmy was able to survive my care and ended up ultimately being rehomed. So honestly, for a long time, I dealt with the guilt of that. I was the stereotypical little kid obsessed with dinosaurs, right? And then I learned that they still live among us. Not really, but uh, kind of. I can poop on me. So I was obsessed with reptiles. You know, I was, uh, I had like a male subscription to like animal trading cards or whatever. Maybe not trading cards, like animal info cards and stuff. And I was always really excited to see the reptile ones. I was looking through books that talked about reptiles as pets and I was always super excited about that. But my first go at it, was not not fantastic. So a lot of time has passed, uh, more than a decade, and a move halfway across the country, a whole lot of wrestling involved in there that took a lot of my time. But now I get my redo, right? And I'm really excited to have my redo to try to take good care of the animals that I have now, like, like Miss Beep, right Beep? And I'm really stoked for this opportunity to try to right those wrongs. And I'm really glad Rachel let me live my crazy life and I'm really glad she's having a good time with it too. So now, enough about me. Let's talk about that dogma that I mentioned in the intro. It became somewhere along the lines widely accepted that these animals are, are not too big on thinking and they really just engage in basic biological processes. You know, eating, drinking, breathing, sleeping, breeding even on, on some occasions. But we're starting to learn now, thanks in large part to Tom Crutchfield, our Lord and Savior Tom Crutchfield, and also a bunch of other keepers that uh, take their husbandry really seriously, take enrichment seriously, and are kind of spreading the good word, so to speak. Thanks to them, we're learning that these animals are thinkers. These are animals that are very capable of emotion and very capable of, of thinking, right? And not just moving about just kind of as like NPCs, you know what I mean? So with that, let's cut to the chase. There's a big issue, I'll, I'll call it an issue, some people may not call it an issue, but there's a big issue of things like like breeding racks and whatnot in captive herpticulture. I do have a rack, you probably see the rack, eh, it's somewhere, it's right there, but it's a hatchling rack. These guys just came out of eggs. They probably don't wanna see us too much anyway at this point, and that is not gonna be their forever home. They're, we're gonna keep the first one that we produced and the rest are gonna be rehomed to people that want a little baby African fat-tailed gecko. 
But that's besides the point. But the issue is, is in my opinion, things like large scale, especially ball, it seems to be ball pythons mostly, right? But, you know, to shove an adult female ball python in just a little pullout drawer of like a 32 quart tub, which, and yes, we also have animals in tubs. I know that I'm really not trying to be too much of a hypocrite. Uh, number one, the tubs aren't permanent homes either. Number two, like if we're talking about a, an adult female ball python that's like four foot uh, compared to a 10 inch leopard gecko in a 32 quart tub. I think there is a little bit of a difference. These tubs have a better floor plan for these uh, terrestrial animals than the accepted minimum enclosure size. So that's why I'm comfortable with it for the time being. Anyway, breeding racks is a topic for a whole nother video altogether. Did I just say a whole nother? I hate that. Another is one word. You can't put a word in there. Anyway, and I also don't want a whole bunch of like shade thrown at like these large scale breeders because it's like, you know, we're learning. We're learning these things. It became accepted that these were dumb animals, right? That don't do they, you know, you don't have to worry about their mental health and stuff like that. But now that we learn more things, and in my opinion, I feel like you're kind of just locking them up in like a solitary confinement padded room with like no chance for exercise or anything like that. But like I said, different video. But on that topic, just for one more second, um, people are like, well, they're eating, they're breeding, so they have to be healthy, right? Well, these guys, luckily, I guess, not so luckily for them, I guess, I don't know, it's weird. The fact that they're so hardy and they really can uh, survive and, and operate in conditions that are less than ideal, kind of puts them at risk of people doing these things to them, right? Because, oh, the ball pythons are breeding, they must be happy, right? But I don't know, right? I don't know if they're happy. They're just kind of sitting there. When uh, people, like I mentioned, Tom Crutchfield and other people I could list on and on, people that are putting their animals through enrichment and stuff, it seems that they enjoy it, right? I don't know if they're enjoying it. They don't show mammal type emotions, but it seems like they definitely have emo emotions or at least a more complex mental process than we give them credit for. And I think it's time that we start uh, focusing on that a little bit. So what are we going to do about it? So I'm going to reference the Animals at Home podcast hosted by Dylan Perrin again, as I did in the last video. I really do think it's a great resource for us as herpers. The episode we're going to talk about today a little bit is episode 73 with Dr. Zach Lofman. And this episode was titled Using Natural History to Develop Evidence-Based Husbandry, okay? Evidence-based husbandry meaning you see them do certain behaviors in the wild or behave a certain way in the wild and you try to at least try to replicate that to some degree in your own home. Now, this is important to me because you can start to cater to how the animal actually lives as opposed to what we know keeps them alive, right? Which, I mean, hey, if nothing else, go with the generic care guides that are going to keep the animals alive. Uh, I don't think it's the worst thing. And, and use that as a baseline, right? That's kind of what I'm doing, and we'll talk about that in a second. Because these care guides might not be optimizing uh, the health of the animal, and people are going to say, well, their lifespans are a lot shorter in the wild. Let's say, talking about temperatures, right? There are going to be outlier days in the wild where it might get just super cold out of nowhere one day, and then boom. But the animals are conditioned to live in the environment, right? So if you can find the optimal levels and the optimal temperatures uh, without any kind of crazy phenomena, and then also natural predators, right? We have to think about that. Uh, yeah, they, they might die because maybe there's a shortage of food, their survival of the fittest, you know, maybe the bigger, stronger animals are taking all the food, and we can cut all that away in the home, in their enclosure, and that might lead to longer lifespans than they would experience in the wild. So this subject has birthed a new video series on this channel because I've been really tentative and I'm really avoiding doing care guides on this channel. Do I think I can tell somebody how to keep a bearded dragon alive like from scratch? You know, someone just knocks on my door and go, hey, I just got this. What do I do? Yeah, I think I can keep it alive or at least, you know, give you recommendations on how to keep it alive. But uh, two things about that. Number one, there's a million of those, right? And number two, what on what grounds am I really the authority to do that, right? The answer, none. No grounds am I the authority to tell you how to do that. But 
thanks to uh, Dr. Zach Lofman. And I started doing this pretty funny. Before I even heard this episode, I started doing at least a, a little taste of this. What I did was, uh, I have an iPhone. This video shot on iPhone. Shout out Apple. Except, uh, you know, don't use slave labor. But that's besides the point. I went in the weather app. I'm sure you can do this on Android too or whatever you want. Went on the weather app and I found a large city in the in the native range of each of my species here. And I said, let me just take a look at the weather, right? So I've been kind of tracking the weather, seeing if the temperatures are right. And what you miss here is going to be like the basking temperatures. Because like, I don't know exactly how hot a rock is in the center of Australia. I just know the ambient like air temperature. But it's something to work off of. So what this new video series is going to be. It's not going to be care guides, right? It's going to be me, us together, really, doing a deep dive on natural history of each of these animals, right? So things like I'll be looking up studies, uh, scholarly articles on, like, the diet of a bearded dragon. And I'll use some software to find the weather for the distribution of these animals. And that way, uh, it's not me telling you what to do, right? It's us learning together together. Just some things that maybe we didn't know about these animals. So I think we're going to start that out as a new weekly thing. One of these, one of the two videos of the week are going to be a deep dive like that into the natural history of each of these animals. And we'll see if we can't improve our husbandry as a herpticulture as a whole. I hope this is something that you guys would like to see. If it is, let me know in the comments. Uh, if you think it's a dumb idea, let me know in the comments. But honestly, I'm probably going to do it anyway, because I want to know about it. I'm going to be spending a lot of time looking these things up, and why not get it for some content, right? So, Bartaby is excited, because it might be able to replicate her natural habitat a little more, even though you've never seen Australia, have you? Donate money to me so we can fly Bartaby to Australia. No, I'm kidding. Don't do that. But, uh, you know, I'm really excited for this, because again, like I said, even... 50 years from now when I still have a whole bunch of reptiles I'm still gonna be I'm still gonna be fine trying to find new ways of of how to keep them better and I'm not gonna try to get stuck in that you know oh we already know what we're doing we don't need to learn anymore this is a, a new thing and it's the hobby itself is I don't want to call it a hobby the the lifestyle the whatever the these animals are growing in popularity and what that means to me is that a bunch of more people are gonna come in more ideas can get thrown around and the cream can rise to the top. So I'm really excited about it. But anyway, that's it. If you like hearing me rant a little bit, uh, make sure you remember to like this video and subscribe to our channel. We'll be posting videos twice a week. One now is going to be the natural history of one of these species per week. So once again, I'm Raph, guys. This is Bartaby. We both thank you so much for watching. You've been watching Red Room Reptiles. I'll see you next time.